I'm Dalton Roberts, and I'm the pastor of Parkway Baptist Church in Trinity, Alabama. And I'm here in Webster, New York at the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church, and we're having a wonderful time with Pastor Jack Young. And we are having a biblical preaching workshop. We have uh, hosted numerous biblical preaching workshops, had a couple at our church in Alabama, and we've had one up in two, I think, up in Maine. And so it's a new thing that we're doing, and I'm very excited about it. It is our goal to encourage preachers not only to determine to preach the Word of God, to preach sermons that are shaped by the Scripture, where the Scripture is the sermon, but it is our goal to, to, to do some teaching and to provide some information, some extended education in the subject, in the area of biblical preaching, trying to be an encouragement to preachers, pastors, missionaries in the area of the most important work that we do, and that is preaching the Bible. I mean, we're having a great time here. We have James Knox from DeLand, Florida. There's not a better preacher anywhere than Brother Knox, and man, he has really fed us and encouraged us in the Word of God. And so I hope you'll enjoy these videos, and they will give you an indication of what we're trying to do. We, we don't have all the answers. We are just trying to share some good information. And we do believe, it is our conviction, that if preaching is not biblical, I don't mean using the Bible, but if it is not shaped by the Scripture, if the Word of God in its context is not the point of the preaching, it's not biblical preaching. And we hope that this will be an encouragement to you, and maybe you can look up one of our uh, workshops in the future and attend, and we hope it would be a blessing to you. Amen. Amen. Well, what a blessing. I'll bring you greetings from the balmy, leafy glades of North Alabama. And uh, it's good it's good to be here. And uh, well, this is western New York, right? I'm going to upstate Wednesday. Is that the way that works up here? All right. Well, it's very good to be here. I, I, I remember preaching in this church uh, fondly. Had a good time. And it was a wonderful time. Have great fellowship with Brother Young. And uh, man, what a blessing to be with... What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit, little bit travel-addled, but with Brother Knox, and what a blessing he has been a blessing to me for many, many years ago. And uh, how, how many of you know that when someone helps you when you're down, you just don't forget it? You know what I mean? How it just has an effect. And, and uh, Brother Knox doesn't know this, I don't think, but he preached for me one time years ago in Florida. And uh, my wife wasn't there because she was sick and having a difficult time. It was very unusual for her to be out of a service. And, uh, and, and I was, it was serious enough that we, I was affected negatively by it. And he was just an incredible encouragement. I've never forgotten that. And one of those people I feel like I should spend more time with. You know how that goes. You don't have, you only got so much time, right? You've got grandkids and a church. And I love Brother Knox. And it's not a backslapping session. It's just an expression of gratitude for what he does, right? And uh, I appreciate all you folks. This crowd is unbelievable. And so let's, let's move forward in a positive way and see what we can do, what we can accomplish. So let me say a few things uh, to get started. First of all, let me tell you how this whole burden came about. It began uh, about five years ago now when I, I wanted to be a better preacher. And I, I felt like I had become stale. And um, so I started acquiring all of the best stuff that I could find on the subject. Still got a long way to go, but man, I have quite a section of books now just dealing with preaching, the historic seminal textbooks on the subject. And then, of course, you try to find the things in the archives and the old stuff, and, and you just scrounge up everything you can. And it's an interesting study because you, when you go at it that way, you begin to see who's been reading whom, right? Is that, is that correct English? <laughs> And, and you kind of get a feel for that, and that's been rewarding. But the point is, it had a real uh, reviving effect in, in my own personal life, and I enjoyed it a great deal. And I began to see some things and learn some things, so I wanted to share it. And that's kind of why we started having the workshop in Alabama, and it kind of had some positive, encouraging results. And so the moral of that story is, all I'm going to be saying to you is what I have learned that has been a help to me, all right? 
Now, I'm going to try to make one apology and then just not do it anymore, all right? Because from this point on, I'm going to be my regular, sarcastic, arrogant, know-it-all self, all right? But that's just a shtick. That's just my personality, okay? That's all that is. What I want you to understand is that nobody's an expert at this subject matter, okay? But in every other field, people, are, people have continuing education, Tiger Woods had a coach, his you know, multiple coaches his entire career. So you, you, we should want to be better. And I feel like there's a, a bit of an atmosphere in our circles that it's okay to criticize the skinny jeans preachers and we can blow up the preachers who have the purple lights and the smoke machines, fine. But if somebody dare check us, now they're being critical of preaching. Maybe they're just being critical of bad preaching. <laughs> See what I'm saying? And so we, we've got to do better. And uh, that's my burden, and that's, that's what I wanted to lay, lay before you. I, I've read a bunch of people. I'll quote a lot of people. None of them have been r r filtered. You understand? I'm not going to pretend I didn't read things that I did. I read them all. I'm a very ecumenical reader, <laughs> all right? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a right-wing, Bible-thumping, independent Baptist, and I believe in militant separation as it relates to the gospel. I believe in that. I believe in opposing liberalism. But everything that's different for me is not liberal. So you can just take what you want and leave what you don't. But a lot of times what we need the most is what we like the least. Right? It's just something to think about, you know. And uh, you go into the gym and... You got these big dudes that do curls for girls all the time, and they've got chicken legs. And I want to say to them, man, you need to go about six weeks and do nothing but leg day, right? <laughs> you need to get in the squat rack and stay in there for, because what you don't like is probably what you need. And that's what I found to be true in my own life. And so I had to make, get comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? So that's what we're here to do. I, I'm just saying I love you, brethren. And it's a blessing to be able to talk to you about this great work of preaching. So that's what we're going to try to do. So tonight, I want to talk to you about uh, this subject, um, expositional preaching more than a matter of style. All right? So that's where we're, that's where we're coming from. If you're already irritated, I, I just don't know what to tell you. Okay? So you, you'll just have to understand I'm not your enemy because I tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, just hang in here and let's think it through. Expositional preaching, more than a matter of style. We might title this lecture a dagger in the back. In some of these studies, some of this research, I began to, this is a good practice, by the way, if you're reading a book that is good, that you really like, that is substantive and useful, the bibliography can be a real help to you. And so you read what they read, right? That's, that's how you give yourself an, a practical education. And so I, I ran across this name and the title of the book I felt like, uh, I felt was noteworthy. The title of the book was The Way to Biblical Preaching. And it was published in 1957 by a Presbyterian pastor named Donald G. Miller. So I ordered the book. Isn't it a good thing the way you, isn't it good how you can do these things these days? You can be reading, pick up your phone, look up the title of the book on Amazon or eBay or, or, or one of the other machine, you know, search engines and order the book without ever getting out of your chair. Two days later, it's on your porch. Now, I mean, that is just as good as it gets. Amen. I was told to do something. Well, that's, yeah, that's why I had it over there. But anyway. <laughs> uh, I, I was only going to wear this tie once. That's, that's fine. <laughs> so <laughs> Donald G. Miller, pastor of the Highland Park Presbyterian Church of Dallas, 1957, The Way to Biblical Preaching. Now, those words are, are fraught with meaning, I, I thought. So I ordered the book, and here was the first line in the preface of this modest little book. 
Someone has remarked that if Protestantism ever dies with a dagger in its back, the dagger will be the Protestant sermon. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I thought this guy, <laughs> he's never met independent Baptists evidently. And I, I got to thinking about that. And if, if the same thing could be said about independent Baptists, if we're going to have a future, it's going to be because of biblical preaching. A regular, consistent theological exposition of the gospel is absolutely necessary if we're to have any kind of meaningful future. And if we don't, if we continue to, um, I think, dissipate, and become rep or, or if we continue to be represented by the radical fringe, then um, it's going to be because of the Independent Baptist Sermon. Now, let me say this. I don't have to prove to you that there's some craziness in our circles. Okay? So if you're giving me, I wonder if this guy's a progressive look right now. Let me tell you right now. I'm a King James Bible thumping, right wing, big B Baptist. Big A, put the capital locks on it. Cap locks on and spell Baptist. That's what I am. And I, and I believe every word in the King James Bible. I believe in, again, militant separation. I didn't say radical. Militant. There's a difference, and the difference is what are you separating over? Every difference isn't a separation issue. Every disagreement is not something that should be fodder for ridiculing the brethren in public sermons and meetings. Some of our behavior in the pulpit is outrageous. It's humiliating, and it's embarrassing, and nobody says that. So I'm, I'm willing to go down fighting, right? I'm willing to make these comments publicly as often as I can so that good men like the men I'm looking at right now will be encouraged not to give up the faith and turn into some progressive, but to preach these truths that we hold dearly with meaning, well-prepared sermons. I, I, let me give you an example, personal example of what I'm talking about. And I don't want this to be awkward, but you'll be hard-pressed to find a man who preaches straighter against sin and error than James Knox. It'd be hard to find that guy. He preaches against stuff. He makes up stuff to be against, all right? <laughs> so there's no compromise in this guy at all. But you know what? I've never, ever, ever, ever heard him preach where I thought he was being nasty. He, he, he's never preached anything that was embarrassing to me as to be identified with him. Right? Never. And so we speak the truth in what? Love. Love. I have an author that I read a lot. He's probably my all-time favorite. But he's a little mean. Right? And I don't have a, I don't have a problem with well-directed, sanctified meanness. I, I'm, all, I'm fine with that. I'm a grown man. I'm cool with that. <laughs> but when you can't talk about a passage of Scripture in your commentary that deals with love of the brethren without spending the entire time ridiculing the kind of love that liberals are for. Okay, I, I agree with you. Liberals misunderstand the Sermon on the Mount. I agree with you. The only passage they know is that in Psalm 23. I agree with that. But love is still a distinctive mark of genuine Christianity. Am I right? See? Now I'm going to keep reading that guy. Don't get me wrong. All right, well, you get the point. Donald Miller, let's go back to what he said. Someone has remarked that if the Protestant, if Protestantism ever dies with a dagger in its back, the dagger will be the Protestant sermon. So he gives an example of sermonizing run amok. He takes this from a literary critic of his day. I'll read it to you. Quote, it was based on a pencil. Yes, a pencil. It seems that the graphite or soul of a pencil is more important than the wood or body, and a pencil has an eraser which has something to do with your sins being blotted out. What pleased me so much was not the sermon itself, but the text. In order to give his idea a scriptural tie-in, the rector took as his text, quote, Pilate answered, What have I written, or what I have written, I have written. <laughs> 
which gave a delightful picture of Pilate in his toga chewing his eraser on the end of a modern lead pencil. You get the point. That's not a sermon. Probably somebody in here would say, well, that's pretty good. What's wrong with that? <laughs> because we come up in a culture that makes the illustration the sermon. The stories, the sermon. If you see a, you know, a, a, a dog in the garbage and it gives you a picture of something that you think is scriptural, I've heard preachers say, man, I got a sermon that God gave me so, a sermon right there. This is your sermon. This, this are the sermons right here. It's an endless amount of sermons. Those are the sermons. It's my conviction that there's a need for our men, independent Baptist preachers, to determine to preach the Bible and only the Bible. And convictions worth holding demand candor in their expression. And we have to be clear. There's a story that involves a scene where a man named Henry Weston, he was a preacher from up in this neck of the woods in the 19th century. He went to Brown University and he went to Newton Theological Seminary and he pastored in Peoria and he pastored in New York City. And then eventually he became the president of Crozer Seminary in Pennsylvania. So he was a, a, a formidable 19th century theologian and preacher. And he was preaching with D.L. Moody. And so he's preaching away and he hears D.L. Moody behind him. You ever preach with guys like that where you can't really preach for their talking, <laughs> right? And so D.L. Moody sat behind him and D.L. Moody says kind of under his breath only out loud, well, there goes another one of my sermons. And so Weston stopped. And he, what? What are you talking about? And he said, well, your explanation of this passage just uh, eliminated another one of my sermons because my interpretation is obviously inadequate, right? And yes. And to me, that make, that's a strength not a weakness. The 1644 First London Confession of Particular Baptists says this, we confess that we know but in part. Now, let's just start there. <laughs> we confess that we know but in part and that we are ignorant of many things which we desire and seek to know. And if any shall do us that friendly part to show us from the word of God that we see not, we shall have cause to be thankful to God and them. That is referred to as the, the principle or the doctrine of mutability. Now, we don't have it all down. So let us consider what does it mean to preach the Bible. And right here is the whole, the whole issue tonight, all right? This is where the, uh, the argument arises in our circles. Maybe I can spell it correctly. All right? Th this is where the conversation is had. Now, you know independent Baptists are a diverse bunch. So some of my history, is with, or most of my history is with groups that was spit before they say that word. Right? <laughs> Or after, they want to get the taste out of their mouth. They hate it. But there are a lot of independent Baptists that do revere expository preaching. So you'll find tonight I'm talking like I'm talking to the enemy. Like I'm in the lion's den. And you probably, two-thirds of you, maybe more, maybe this is the kind of preaching that you believe in. Or, But here's another problem. A lot of people think they're doing it. And they're not. All right? The argument is over what that actually is. And I'm going to tell you that if I've had 100 conversations with independent Baptists about what expository preaching is, if I've had 100, 96 of them have been conversations where I mean one thing and they mean something else, where we're talking right past each other. Does that make sense? So you can't have a meaningful conversation about doctrine and theology and ministry unless you begin with an agreement on the terms. And if there's a disagreement, you have to represent your opponent's position in a way in which they would agree with it. If you're going to disagree with a Calvinist, it would help to understand what they believe. There's a lot of anti-Calvinism information out there that seems to not understand anything that they believe. But that's not necessary to represent your opponent well. You, are you with me? Right. Right. So it makes the, the, the 
the polemic is more meaningful, more helpful if we represent it well. So, okay, all right, you get the point. So the crux of the matter. Let's begin with a conversation about bad definitions, okay? Let's talk about some bad definitions. The most popular misdefinition of expository preaching is that it involves preaching through a book of the Bible or preaching verse by verse. All right? Now, I'm going to tell you, that's the best way to do it in my opinion, especially as a pastor. It's a fantastic way to do it, and I believe in it, and I practice it on a regular basis. But the definition of expository is not, is not, is not preaching through a book of the Bible verse by verse. That's not what the word means. All right? So stay with me. We're going to get there. Standalone sermons. Let me say this. No advocate of expository preaching is beating the drum for reading a verse, explaining it, and moving on to the next verse. Reading a verse, explaining it, moving to the next verse. As an unbroken running commentary. And that's why so many independent Baptists reject that because we have great preachers in our heritage. We do love great, passionate preaching. And the idea that we must give up the great preaching for a dry, boring, seamless, running commentary is, is, is objectionable to, to many of us. I, okay, I, I, can, I can accept that. However, <laughs> you would be better off to read a verse and explain it and read a verse and explain it and read a verse and explain it than to do some of the things I'm seeing done in pulpits. I can't tell you how often I've had a preacher say, man, look at this. God gave me a thought right here. You know, read the verse and show me. And I go, man, that's good. But you do understand that's not what that passage is talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's a good thought, ain't it? No, it's a bad thought. If it's not what the text means, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and it's hard to talk like this, especially to our circles, because here's the way it comes across. This guy thinks he knows everything. I don't know everything, but I know a crummy sermon when I hear it. <laughs> Amen. And we keep propping this stuff up. I'm not talking about talent tonight. I'm not talking about giftedness. Everybody has a different skill set. Not everybody's outgoing. Not everybody's the life of the party. Not everybody's as smart as Jim Alter. Not everybody as profoundly thoughtful as Brother Knox. But listen, every man who's called of God can labor in word and doctrine and bring sermons that will be transformational to the listener. Everybody can do that, all right? Standalone sermons preclude the possibility of preaching through the Bible. They do not preclude exposition. Does that make sense? If exposition required preaching through a book of the Bible, you couldn't go to a conference and preach one standalone expositional sermon. But you absolutely can, okay? One can preach a single expositional sermon, and exposition does not require that you preach a series. It does not have to be boring, dry, lacking propositional features. If done well, it will be the opposite. So those are some bad definitions of what exposition is. Next, bad descriptions. Another bit of misinformation about exposition involves the contrived policy of some nebulous or arbitrary number of verses. It's got to be so long a text for it to be expository. Almost, almost, not all, almost all textbook authors and homileticians would reject that. That's not true. The number of verses is not what makes it expository. Now, Andrew Blackwood thought it that it did. He, he alluded to this in his book, The Preparation of Sermons, and said an expository sermon... Here means one that grows out of a Bible passage longer than two or three verses. Now, I've heard Sam Davison preach from one verse and, and just dump Bible on you like a dump truck to explain and expound the one verse. You with me? Yeah. Merrill Unger said the opposite. He objected to this kind of homiletical, homiletical pedantry when he said if a clear and unconfused definition is to be arrived at, the valid criterion, it would seem, is not the length of the portion treated, whether a single verse or a larger unit, but the manner, the manner of treatment. 
Now that, my friends, is key. The manner of treatment. Now this is the real source. This is the real source of my frustration. This is the reason for my willingness to be a punk about this. Because people who profess to be the last vanguard of stalwart fundamentalism treat the scripture with great disrespect sometimes. We're a group of people that holds to the belief that we believe in a preserved text, right? I don't think people who have the critical text position are liars. I just believe we have a difference of opinion about this thing. And we believe that we hold the Bible in our hands. Okay? That's what I believe. But there's a lot of people, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people out there who have 1611 stamped on everything they own. It's, it, it's, it's half of fundamentalism's uh, 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 security code for their, you know, for their house and their phones. 1611, amen. The whole world's full of guys that preach nothing but that King James Bible, amen. And that's all they talk about, and they thump it and wave it and rave about it and never preach it. You know I'm telling you right. And I don't understand it. I do agree that it's ridiculous to take something like this that elevated the English-speaking world like nothing else that is produced by the collective work of some of the greatest linguistic scholars in the history of the world. The fruit that it has produced is immeasurable. I, I disagree with the crowd that wants to ridicule it constantly. I'm not with them. I'm a King James Bible thumper. But if you believe it, you ought to preach it. That's what I think. And you know I'm talking right. <laughs> I heard you got to preach one time, and he said that 87 times in the sermon. <laughs> That's right. That's why he, you know I'm talking right. Well, I, you haven't said anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Vine said the same thing. He said, some homileticians have defined exposition by the length of the given text. Exposition, however, is not determined by the length of the passage. Exposition is not a sermon form, but a process by which the words of God are communicated. Not a sermon form, but a process by which the words of God are communicated. Now, see, that would fly in the face of much of what we have heard. Interesting anecdote. I was in the airport in Jacksonville. I look around, and there stands Jerry Vines. And I used to listen to him on the radio. I mean, he, he, he was, uh, well, he's still alive, a very conservative Southern Baptist. I heard him preach against booze on, on Sunday morning from the largest Southern Baptist church in the country at that time like any fighting fund he's ever done it. I mean, wore it out with the King James Bible, right? So I respect him, love him, you know. And so we got to having a conversation, and that was back in the days when I first learned what the definition of this word was. <laughs> and so I was trying to develop my ability to preach expositional sermons without losing passion, and you know how it goes, trying to learn, right? So it was great to see him, talk to him a little bit, and he made this statement. He said, you know, he said, John R. Rice said that uh, expositional preaching would kill a church. He said, but I have not found that to be the case. <laughs> he was preaching to a few people on Sunday mornings. But anyway, you know, I love John R. Rice. I'm just saying that was, that's wrong. That's just not true. So, bad definitions, bad descriptions. And then there's bad dogma. And I'd like to really drill down here, but I don't have time. So let's try to move quickly. But... A few years back, there was a scandal uh, among us, and one of the brethren wrote an article for the Sword of the Lord. Amen. Amen. No jokes. <laughs> wrote an article for the Sword of the Lord, and um, he said in this article that one of the reasons we are having problems with moral crises could be the lack of expositional preaching. I think he said expositional. If he didn't, he used a different word that means 
essentially the same thing. And I, I think there might be more to it than that. I don't know. You know what I mean? I, I, but it, it was just his thought, and I certainly wouldn't quibble with a guy who's saying we should preach the Bible more. I'm for that. But one of the brethren was incensed over this and wrote this big um, blog article. And he gave a bunch of reasons why a person might prefer what he called a style of preaching exclusively. Now, it's not a style. It's not just a matter of style, right? All right. But that's the way he, way he saw it. Here's some of his reasons. One reason he said is the problem with our preaching is not the lack of style, but the lack of power. Now, there's a lot of things about that objectionable that are objectionable, one of which, the most would be, that in this guy's mind, the style of preaching, he says it's just a style, the style of preaching can affect your power in the pulpit. I would think it would be this that would affect your power in the pulpit. Right? We all know that there are preachers that are more conversational. But they are riveting because they are well prepared and they're preaching this. And what they say is thoughtful. Right? Because they're not giving warmed over uh, syllogisms and, and, and repeated outlines. They're actually preaching the word of God that is in them. And, and, and we've all heard guys that have stand on six inches of their pant leg and butcher the king's English and spit to the back row, but they spent time in this book and they love God, and they're also used of God. So we're not talking about style. We're talking about going into the pulpit as a man of God, opening his word and preaching that to people. The Bible. See. He said maybe we want to skirt preaching on standards. And with more textual or exegetical preaching, we can avoid such issues. What? You're telling me that if I preach the Bible, then that disallows the preaching of standards? That's what he said. I'm going to suggest to you, brethren, that if you can't preach the Bible and your standards you might have some bad standards. You might be starting a cult. I did a study recently, I was telling Brother Jack today, about sin. And just my own study. In other words, I didn't find someone else's list. I just tried to find everything in the Bible that the Bible calls a sin. And you know there are lists, you know there are numerous lists in the New Testament. And there are sins of attitude and, 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 and so forth that are spirit, sins of the spirit. And then there are sins of the flesh. And there's some that, and so pretty, very exhaustive study and a lot of material in there. There's a lot of sin to be preached against <laughs> without making things up. And you know what else you could do? You could just be honest about your hang-up. You could say, I, I just feel like if the, if the SEC game day people are wearing suits and if the talk show people are wearing suits and if senators wear suits, I, maybe a man of God, at least on Sunday morning, maybe he should look like he gives a rip. Yeah. <laughs> but that's just my opinion. So that's all you need to say. How much time do you need to spend on that? Skinny jeans, skinny jeans. I bet I've heard a thousand sermons where half the sermons about skinny jeans. All these skinny jeans wearing guys. You know, come on, man. There's got to be something else in the Bible besides your hang-up about somebody's jeans. I don't remember the last time I had a bad day or a dark moment or a difficult time over somebody's skinny jeans. <laughs> you think people were dying over it. Another thing he said is Jesus did not preach expositional sermons. He told human stories and used parables. That's the most threadbare argument of all. It, it is the most worn out trope against expository preaching that you will ever hear. And it is just false. There's two kinds of preaching in the, in the Bible. Revelatory and explanatory. 
There is that preaching where God has given His prophet, His voice, whoever it is, you know, He's given them His Word and they are revealing it to the listeners. Okay? That's one. The other is explanatory where someone is explaining what has already been revealed. Jesus did both of them. That's what He did. And on, the men on the Emmaus Road. He, he, he could have created another world. He could have made a monkey type Shakespeare right before their very eyes. But what he did was open their eyes to the Scripture. Amen. The Apostle Paul went into the synagogue on the, on, the, in, on the Sabbath day opening and alleging, right? Remember that? Preaching from the Scriptures and laying Christ alongside the Old Testament Scriptures. That's exposition. That's what it is. You and I, however, are not Jesus. We are not the Word of God. Everything that comes out of our mouths is not God's Word. So we have to preach. You want to preach stories? Preach Jesus' stories. Preach His Word. Pentecost was absolutely expositional. I don't know why people, where people get that that's not expositional. He's literally explaining to the people this dispensationally significant moment with Scripture. <laughs> That's exposition. That's what it is. He didn't say, no, he didn't get up on Pentecost and say, this is our 14th sermon from First Chronicles. We're going to go to... No, but that's, that's a stylistic necessity. That's not at the essence of what exposition is. He said, maybe we're embarrassed at being thought of as less intellectual. I'm going to read this so that I say it the way I want to say it. Exposition is not an exercise in intellectualism. Carefully explaining the text is not high-minded. While the theology of many passages lends itself to laborious study and elaborate explanations, rank intellectualism is not necessary, nor is it a worthy goal. The effort to be thorough to plumb the depths of a passage should not result in overcomplicated dissertations, nor should the effort to celebrate simplicity lead to shallow, banal diatribes. To suggest that healthy exposition is tantamount to showing off says more about the detractor than it does the advocate, right? He said, maybe you just don't want to be a hellfire and brimstone preacher anymore. All right. What is, what is it about this that is contrary to hellfire and brimstone preaching? I, I know what it is. That guy thinks that preaching on hell should be about the crazy story of a car wreck and screaming until you bust a blood vessel in your head. That's where the power of God's at. When really, it's here. And in the 21st century, when people are... Are, 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 are more secularized than ever before in this country. And they come into our churches. And we're going to tell them, if you don't believe Jesus Christ, you are condemned to eternal hell and there's nothing, no hope for you without Jesus. We have to explain it to them with authority from the Scripture and do it with passion and compassion and authority, right? From the Scripture. So it's... Expositional preaching is not an enemy of hellfire and brimstone preaching. It's the foundation of it. Right. It's what gives it authority. Well, let's clarify the matter. What do we start with? We said that we were going to talk about the crux of the matter. Now let's clarify the matter. Let's begin in a novel place for determining definitions, shall we? How about the dictionary? Is everybody okay with that? In the Oxford English Dictionary, the word exposition is, exp is defined as the action of... You ready? You ready? The action of expounding. Maybe I don't get why that means something to me. <laughs> You've got to say exposition, expository. That ain't in the Bible. Okay, Jimbo, how about, how about expound? Can we use that one? 
By the way, neither is rapture, neither is incarnation, neither is Trinity, neither is your mom. <laughs> All right? So, I'm sorry, I'm channeling Jim Alter right there, my bad. The act of expounding or explaining interpretation, explanation. That's the Oxford English Dictionary. Pretty good source. The Webster's 1828 defines exposition as an explanation, interpretation, a laying open the sense or meaning of an author of any passage in a writing. That's, that's what it is. It's not a style. It's the entire process of preaching the Word. Not one thing in the definitions of exposition speaks to the methodology of sermonizing, but rather the philosophy or the purpose therein. It's not a, not a methodology we're talking about here. It, it's the manner of treatment of the Scripture and what you do with it once you've learned it. That's what it is. There's a section heading. But By the way, this is the key word. Exposit means this. Explain. That's what it means. You guys know that we could do this and I could never use this word and it wouldn't be remotely controversial. I could just say biblical preaching, expound, expound biblical preaching. But here's the problem with that. Is people will leave thinking they agree with you when they don't. Do you know how often I've had somebody listen? We'll have these long, detailed conversations, and then you hear them talk later, and they're repeating what you said. They're giving you their view as if you said it, and it's contrary to your view. You have that sometimes with your people you preach to, right? It takes people a while to get it. Or you see their Facebook post, and you're thinking, holy cannoli, they go to my church. How could they have that idea? There's a disconnect when we have a predisposition. And I'm going to tell you something, brethren. There's a lot of different styles and a lot of different ways to do it. But there is one purpose for preaching and one only. And that is to explain the text. Your sermon is not the, 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 the shining feature of the hour. The text is what they're there for. The scripture which is really what your sermon is supposed to be, a way of making the Scripture known. Now, I have to ask you, if that's irksome to you, what else do you think a sermon's for? Now, I know what we, what, we have, what we do. We think of special occasions. Well, you know, I went down and preached this Valentine's banquet, and I just went, I'm not saying you've got to go expound Zechariah at the Valentine's banquet. And I don't think that's what is causing the, 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 the deterioration of preaching is what we're doing at the Valentine's banquet and the workers' breakfast. I'm talking about when we get in the pulpit to preach. But I will say this. I will get in your business right here. There's way too much special event stuff in our pulpits, in my opinion. So that if you look at the calendar, in a calendar year, the number of Sundays that are dedicated to themes and to secondary issues and to sidetracks and distractions besides preaching the Word of God, it's kind of staggering. Amen. And I'm astounded at how many people will have big days and invite the whole county and they've got twice their average attendance there and they're going to do something else besides preach the gospel. That's the time to sing a great hymn or two and let the people hear the people of God singing hymns and to hang all the entertainment and to open the gospel up before their very eyes and preach it to them. There's a section heading in Unger's book, Principles of Expository Preaching, which says expository preaching is first and foremost biblical preaching. It is emphatically not preaching about the Bible, but preaching the Bible. It is a mistake, he said, to impose too narrow a definition upon expository preaching. In the minds of many, this type of pulpit ministry consists simply of a series of sermons expounding some book or books of the Bible. 
While this is undoubtedly an important method of, exposit of the expository approach, it is only one. G. Campbell Morgan wrote, Exposition is not a sermon form, but a process by which the words of God are communicated. You all with me so far? Let me stop here. I realize, here, here's what you could say to me right now. Well, you're quoting a bunch of evangelicals. <laughs> you're not quoting fundamentalists. Well, I'm, I'm with you in, when you say that in certain contexts, but being a fundamentalist does not give you a right to write your own dic dictionary. Are you all with me? And so the primary point I'm making here is that all of the great homileticians of history had the same understanding of what that word is. The only reason we have a weird definition of it is because we heard the definition from people who don't want to do it. Right? You would not like my definition of legalism if you want to preach against tap water and wire rim glasses. Right? I love water when it's poured through coffee grounds. Amen. <laughs> Haddon Robinson, the, you'd know Haddon Robinson, I would expect. He wrote the most popular book on this subject in the last 50 years. And he said expository preaching at its core is more a philosophy than a method. Y'all see how often this is coming up? More a philosophy than a method. If expository preaching is a style understood to be preaching through the Bible or preaching verse by verse, then someone somewhere with some expertise in the, era of hom in the area of homiletics should recognize it as such. But they don't. Consider many different men from many different stripes, all right? Let's try that. Let's, let's, don't choke on this ecumenism here. <laughs> the gold standard for preaching textbooks is one entitled On the Preparation and Delivery of Sermons by John Broadus. He was the great 19th century Baptist at Louisville Seminary. And uh, a, a, a form, the Southern Baptist Printing House or whatever, Broadman Publications, that's a com combination of Broadus's name and Basil Manley's name. All right? So that's life-changing, but there it is. <laughs> Broadus said an expository discourse may be defined as one which is occupied mainly or at any rate very largely with the exposition of Scripture. But that, so exposition means to explain or to expound. And expository preaching is concerned with that. Jerry Vines, Jim Shaddix in Power in the Pulpit said when delivery is added to this whole process of exegesis, hermeneutics, in homiletics, the result can be described as exposition. That's interesting to me. The process of laying open a biblical text in such a way that its original meaning is brought to bear on the lives of contemporary listeners. When the Bible said that Jesus went a little farther, it means that he was talking with some people here and he walked a little farther. That's what it means. It does not mean that Jesus went the extra mile. Amen. <laughs> Jesus doesn't have to go the extra mile. He's God. Everything that he does is exactly enough. It's always on time. And it's more than you could ever hope for. So that's simply twisting a phrase to make a sermon. And here's the response. Don't you believe? I don't know why I always use that voice when I'm... <laughs> <laughs> don't you believe in going the second mile I do there's a verse in the Bible about that I think yeah. now I'm, I'm almost done with my part here tonight and if you, if you think I'm being I'm beating a dead horse it's necessary yes, right to beat the horse to death and to make it, get it completely done so that we're all on the same page. And by the way, you are quite welcome to disagree with me. I'm nobody special. 
and before your own master you stand or fall, let a man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I'm just challenging you to preach the Bible. That's the essence of it. If my sarcasm bothers you, I will apologize for that. Someday, maybe. <laughs> but right now, I'm just saying, <laughs> preaching the Bible is vital. And you can't, we're all opposed to postmodernism. Am I right? We're all opposed to that, everybody having their own kind of truth. We're again that. Well, you can't make preaching the Bible something other than what it is. All right? So maybe the resistance to this kind of preaching is rooted in the desire to emphasize things that are not in the Bible, requiring a wrangling of texts and slippery slope arguments and exaggerated syllogisms. Maybe that's what it is. But if you're bound to preach this, it eliminates a lot of that stuff. It takes a lot of it out. For instance, I hate flip-flops. I don't think a real man wears flip-flops. I, I question a man's manhood if he wears flip-flops. And, and I feel like some of you wear them. I, I, I could just feel it. I could sense it. <laughs> the Lord told me we got some flip-flop wearers up in here tonight. And I think I've got good reason. I believe that old Baptist who said leather boots are still in style for men in the footwear. Amen. <laughs> Oh, that was Merle Haggard. I'm sorry, but you, you understand what I'm saying. I'm not going to preach against flip-flops just because I don't like them. Right? You know there's preachers that do that. Whatever they dislike, they put on the slippery slope, and they wipe it away. They challenge it with love not the world, because anything you like that I don't is worldly. Right? That preacher said, I wouldn't go to the fair. That Disney, that's world, that's straight out of hell. When are we going to the college football game? I mean, you just couldn't get more secular, more worldly, more fleshly than a football game. I like it. <laughs> Roll Tide, you know what I'm saying? Still in grief, but anyway. All right, enough of that foolishness. Haddon Robinson defined expository preaching as the communication of a biblical concept derived from and transmitted through historical, grammatical, and literary study of a passage of its, in its context, which the Holy Spirit first applies to the personality and experience of the preacher, then through him to his hearers. I'm going to leave out a bunch of stuff here. Um, you know, two of the great books on this subject in the last 50, or uh, real popular books recently, which are more philosophical than a textbook, if, that, if that's the right way to put it, would be uh, Between Two Worlds by Stott and Preaching and Preachers by Lloyd-Jones. So obviously, those guys are different than us in some ways, but almost everything that comes out of their mouth is, is, is profound. And one of the statements from Stott was that to expound Scripture is to bring out of the text what is there and expose it to view. And, and I don't know why we would have a problem with that. So, well, I don't agree with their, some of their views. Fine. I can't imagine somebody promoting infant baptism. But they're right about that point, <laughs> right? So just preach, it, preach, preach the Bible when you preach baptism, right? That, that's the point. That's the point we're making here. Nobody here is turning into a Presbyterian tonight. I, I'm not. I think it would help some of you, but that's anyway. <laughs> so nice. One cannot presume to preach the Bible if explaining the text that supports the message is not central to the sermon. We've all seen it. A guy takes about 60 seconds to explain the text so we can get to his outline. Right? So we can get on to his sermon. And, the sermon may, and if a guy's really good, really good at it, sometimes you don't catch it. Right? If you're about two-thirds through it and you're like, this doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. Man, this is good. <laughs> that, that may be the worst kind, right? Parker said that expository preaching cons consists in the explanation and application of a passage of Scripture. Watch this. Without explanation, it is not expository. Without application, it is not preaching. Now, you know that word application, we can go to seed on that. I don't think as much application is needed as some preachers think. I think if you preach the text and made it clear and they understand it, all the stuff we can say about what they should do about what we've told them, eh, could be overkill. Sometimes it becomes carnal and, and self-interested. 
or, or a, a product of self-interest. But in, in the strictest, most pristine sense, application is great. You know, the old way of doing it is explain, illustrate, and apply. Right? Here's how you apply this. Well, how do you apply be kind one to another? Well, just start being nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Knock off the meanness. And most people already know if you have labored in the text, they already have an idea of what they've been doing that they shouldn't be doing. I'm not talking, saying that we shouldn't preach against sin specifically and call sin, sin. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the more you get down that, kick that can of application down the road, the more you can get into people having to spend their time listening to you talk about what you care about mm-hmm. instead of talking about what God cares about. And it probably is important that we not confuse those two. Okay. Another popular treatment of this subject goes along these lines. Discussions about preaching divided into three types. Topical, textual, and expository. Topical messages usually combine a series of Bible verses that loosely connect with a theme. I, one of my first sermons that I preached that I thought was great I thought got some traction was the sermon from Genesis 30, I think it is, in verse 1. But when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. So I preached about soul winning. Friend. Give me children or else I die. George Whitfield said, Give me souls or take my own. You know what I mean? And I mean, you tell enough stories and go wild enough, everybody's for winning souls. And I mean, it, 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 you, you know what I mean? I'm not ashamed of it. It just wasn't the right way to go. Plus, I stole it from Leonard Ravenhill. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that, that's a, that's a, <laughs> I'm not the only one that's done that in this room, I guarantee you. <clears throat> that's a topical way of doing it. And, and it, I, my goal in the sermon was not to teach what was happening in that text. I used the text to say what I wanted to say. Right? Right? It's not Bible preaching. Textual preaching uses a short text or a passage that generally serves as a gateway to whatever subject the preacher chooses to address. By contrast, expository preaching focuses predominantly on the text or texts under consideration along with its context. I think we have an idea of what we're talking about here. And we'll talk about it more through the week, but I'll, I'll close my thoughts with this. I think there are some tendencies in our circles that would preclude a commitment to exposition. Now, l- let me wrap this up, and I want to ask you to hear me as if l- the way you listen to your doctor. Now, how many of y'all know that just because a doctor says it doesn't make it true, yeah. right? But but you're going to hear them because you may not have the answer, right? And, y- and you're going to consider it. Maybe I'll take this medication. Maybe I won't. I, I'd, I'd like to not, you know, or whatever, right? But I'm going to listen, see what they got to say. That's all I want you to do right now, and I'm done. One problem we have is mysticism. Okay, mysticism is the practice that arrives at authoritative conclusions based upon subjective resources like feelings and experience as opposed to objective verifiable facts. Okay, every time a preacher says, God told me, God gave me this message. Well, he gave you the Bible and if the Bible, this message is in the Bible, if it's biblical, okay, he did give it to you. But if you mean because you felt good about it, that, that's not necessarily God. I have felt good about some bad things in my life <laughs> and felt really bad about some good things. Mysticism is a problem. It is a very deep issue. In, you know, in, in recent times, we can run it back to Kierkegaard and the leap of faith and the look within and the effort to find our own truth. And now it's gone so far in our culture that we have people saying, look, I know I'm a dude on the outside, but I feel like a girl on the inside. So I need all of you to adjust your reality to match my internal impulses. That is a rankest possible kind of apostasy. But that has affected our culture so much that it has affected our churches and our preaching. That we have we put more stock in a check coming in the mail that we really needed than we do this. We think we've really got something to preach if a, if a happening comes our way. Amen. 
Sensationalism is another problem. If you understand the essence of great preaching to be the moving stories and the sensational antics of the preacher, then exposition will be unnecessary to you because all you have to do is stand on the pulpit, throw something, break things, set your hair on fire, wrestle your wife in a vat of coleslaw, whatever you can do to get some attention and to work everybody up. And man, the power of God's moving in there. And we've, I've been to many a service where they bust them in from far and wide and everybody that comes to this service is leaning in. You understand? They are ready. Just the right... And they're gone. Wow! It's over. Crossing over, amen. And I mean, it is gone. I like it. I have no problem with the gist of it. But then you go home and you're preaching. I hold church currently in a, in a phone booth. You understand? <laughs> I go home to my small crowd and preach my spleen loose and I don't have the same response. I guess it's because I don't have the power of God. That's not what it is. I remember going to church service as a teenager. A famous fundamentalist was preaching. The center of probably one of the worst moral scandals in all of our history. At the time, he was neck deep in the, in the stuff. Uh, we didn't know it, of course, at the time. He gets up and preaches, preaches on soul winning. You don't win souls because you don't care. And that, that was probably true, and his text was, could have been, that could have been a good sermon. You know, some having compassion, making a difference, but it was very sensational. Massive crowds of people all over the altar, grown people weeping and sobbing. And that was when I was 15, 16, 16, I drove myself. And from that day, that was the mark in my mind of what happens when God really gets in it. Do you know what that did to my head for years? Right? I still want to see people respond. I still want to see people moved by the preaching of the Word of God. But I want it to be the truth in this book that changes them. Okay, sensationalism. Third thing. Third thing would be, and, and I don't want to cause any trouble here, and I, I want to remind you that I'm not a progressive, so don't think I mean throwing away standards and separation here. That's not what I'm saying. But legalism is a legitimate problem. It's a legitimate problem when you equate men's opinions and institutional policies with God's law. They're not the same thing. And people can do some things differently than you, and that doesn't mean they're worldly. That doesn't mean they're corrupt. That, it, it, you, you will, you, you'll die a slow death as a pastor if you have to get all of your flock up past a certain mark of external control to feel like you're doing anything. And then what will happen is you begin to, to, to fight too hard about peripheral matters. And then, you understand? And then you lose, everything can just get completely out of control. Preach the Bible. And, and understand the difference between a standard and, and, and a biblical truth, right? Sometimes a standard is just a rule that we have to establish as an organization to keep order. If you've got a choir, I don't know any text that says, thou shalt not wear this in the choir. But you've got to meet with the choir and say, let's wear this. But there might be a church across town that doesn't wear that. I, who cares? Are you all with me? I mean, unless it's outrageous and violating clear scriptural principles. But legalism can be a problem. Preaching against sin is vital. Eviscerating people openly because you don't care for their style is terrible pulpit behavior, and it happens all the time. And then finally, pragmatism. Just because it works doesn't mean it's right. Gain is not godliness. Right? I love you dearly. We're going to have a good time this week, hopefully, for the three of you that return. <laughs> Just come back to hear Brother Knox. He'll be a blessing, all right? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to teach and to talk about your word and about preaching your word. There's not a one of us in here, Lord, who doesn't need to do better. There's not a one of us in here who doesn't need to be more thoughtful and caring in, 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 in the core of our person when it comes to preaching your word. We pray for your help. We pray you'll bless Brother Knox tonight. We need to hear from him. We pray that you'll encourage us by encouraging him, in Jesus' name, amen.